everyone. Um, welcome to the third in our seminar series. Hey. Screen and just say, say a few words of introduction and then we can make a, a full start. Um, so thanks very much for coming along. Uh, this is uh, the, the third in our sem seminar series on genetic and genomic approaches to studying communities. And uh, we've got an excellent couple of speakers today to round off the series, and I'll, I'll introduce those shortly. I, I just want to remind everyone uh, and introduce everyone who hasn't yet had an introduction that uh, this is a, a series put together by the Evil Tree Network. Um, so we're an a network of uh, 29 institutions across 20 countries uh, and we have a series of activities that you can find out all about if you visit the website eviltree.eu um, but uh, just very briefly we are supporting various activities this seminar series obviously um, and uh, a biannual conference but we also have a, a series of training courses every year, uh, which uh, a, a whole range of topics that may be of interest to some of you, uh, and support a series of funding initiatives for both travel to conferences and meetings, but also for small projects. And I'd encourage you to take a look at the website because there's a lot more information there. You can also uh, follow us on Twitter if you're a Twitter user. Uh, Evil 3 NW. Um, and this seminar and all of our previous seminars from both the, the previous series that we've run, uh, the previous talks in this series, and talks from the uh, the inaugural Evil Tree Conference um, are all available on the YouTube channel. So please do take a look at those. Um, so Without further ado, uh, we have two speakers today. We have one flash talk from Jess Fletcher, who will be speaking to us today about um, a metal tolerance. Um, pardon me while I just pull up my schedule. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I've lost the metal tolerance in a... Uh, let let I'll let Jess introduce her talk. Sorry, I've lost my um, introductory notes, but um, a, she will give a, a five-minute flash talk to introduce her work, a, and then we will follow that with the main presentation um, from Sarah Branco, a, who will be speaking to us today about genetic and genomic approaches to studying communities. So I want to hand over first to Jess, who will give us her flash presentation. Yeah, can you see my screen there? Uh, we can, yes, thank you. Great, yeah. Hi everyone, um, as Stephen mentioned, I'm a postdoc in the Branco Lab and I'm just gonna talk to you today quickly about my project related to um, metal tolerance in a mycorrhizal system. So we study mycorrhizal fungi, which are fungi whose hyphae extend into the soil and interact with plant roots. And in exchange for water and nutrients, the plant actually gives the fungus photosynthetically derived carbon in this kind of mutualistic relationship. And we study the genus Sulis, which is widespread across the Northern Hemisphere and interacts mostly with pines. Uh, the two main species that I study are Sulis brevipes and Sulis tomentosis. And we study these because um, a European cousin um, species, Sulis luteus, has actually been heavily studied in this um, uh, and its ability to tolerate heavy metals in the soil. Um, Sulis luteus in Belgium found growing near zinc smelters has actually shown to have a really high level of metal tolerance compared to isolates found growing in uncontaminated soils. Um, and Sulis luteus has actually been shown to protect its pine partner from metal uh, contamination in soil. So my research questions focus uh, on, are Sulis from North America metal tolerant? And if so, can they protect their pine partners from metal contamination? So once we gather our isolates, uh, we take them back to the lab. And the first thing we do are these metal tolerance assays on agar plates. So here are just some results that I have. You have a tolerant isolate on the top row, a sensitive isolate on the bottom row. 
uh, and going from left to right, we're increasing the concentration of zinc in those agar plates. And you can see that the tolerant isolate here at Sulis tomentosus, it fares a lot better at those higher concentrations of zinc than our sensitive isolate on the bottom. We can actually convert these measurements into EC50 values. And an EC50 value is just the concentration of zinc that inhibits 50% of the fungal growth. Um, and when we compare these values for all of our isolates that we tested, we can actually see there's interspecific variation where Sulis tomentosus is generally more tolerant to zinc than our um, Sulis brevipes species. And we also see a lot of intraspecific variation too, where different isolates of the same species show different levels of uh, tolerance to zinc. So when we want to then look at how our fungus interacts with the plant partner, we can set up these bioassays in the lab where we grow a pine seedling uh, in a soil cone, and then we can inoculate the roots with our fungal isolates of choice. Here on the right, you can see um, one of these bioassays that has been taken out of its container. You can see the pine roots in uh, brown, and then all of this white is actually mycorrhizal fungus growing on the roots. We can then uh, subject these bioassays to various treatments. And because we're interested in metal tolerance, we can uh, water our plants with a uh, H2O containing zinc, and we can monitor the effects um, of having that fungus on the roots or not. So to look at my Colorado isolates and to see if they can protect the pines from metal tolerance, I've actually currently an assay set up where I'm growing pine seedlings with a sensitive, with a zinc sensitive Sulis isolate, and then another set with a zinc tolerant Sulis isolate. I also have a control where I have no fungal inoculation at all. And I'm growing these uh, bioassays along a zinc gradient. And what we hypothesize will happen is that those, um, the bioassays growing with the sensitive Sulis isolate will fare a lot worse at this higher concentration of zinc. And we hope that our um, Sulis that is tolerant to zinc will actually be able to protect its pine partner from the contamination in the soil, similar to what was seen in those Belgian isolates that I talked about a second ago. Uh, so that's where we are right now. Uh, for future work, we're hoping to expand to more testing sites, uh, specifically to sites that have um, a lot of contamination. In Colorado, there's a huge history of mining, so a lot of the soil is contaminated with metals. Um, we're going to expand our metal uh, testing profile. We're currently working on getting uh, cadmium assays up and running. We're also planning to expand to uh, lead as well as other metals. And then hopefully we're going to do some RNA sequencing analysis to determine which pathways um, are being upregulated in the fungus in response to metal, uh, to metal contamination. And we're also hoping to do an, uh, an RNA-seq experiment on those bioassays that we have to look more in depth at the, the fungal pine interactions when exposed to um, heavy metals. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge our funding sources and um, my lab mates and all of our collaborators. And if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to take them. Perfect. Thank you, Jess. Fascinating. Looks like lots of potential. Um, we could take uh, one or two quick questions if anybody has any. Could I ask briefly then maybe just, do you, do you have much idea of the, the isolate diversity in the wild, how that, that's structured in, in populations? A, do, you, do you get more than one isolate type occurring for a host tree genotype in the wild? Yeah, so we actually have several samples from the same site. We try and take them from around 10 meters apart to, you know, hope that they're individual samples and not just clones. Um, but we do see that there are differences in metal tolerance, even from isolates from the same site. Mm. Interesting. Uh, ben, did you have a hand up? Yes, uh, very interesting research. Thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, I have a question about the pine system you work with. Uh, do you have different pine genotypes to, to test in your experiment or what they are coming from? I mean, what we could expect, maybe there is some uh, uh, different genotypes interact, interacting with uh, uh, the strains in a different way. What, what, what is your opinion on this? Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. 
Um, we actually, our collaborators in Florida are actually the ones doing the bioassays, but I know that they get the seeds for the pines from um, seed banks. They can get the seeds of Colorado pines from those seed banks, but I'm not sure exactly of the genotypes of the individual seedlings that, they, that they're using. But that's an interesting question. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks again, Jess. That was really nice snapshots of the work you're doing, and I hope that all goes very well. Um, so uh, I think we can now progress on to our main speaker. Uh, so Dr. Sarah Branco is a, originates from Lisbon, uh, but has worked at the University of uh, Chicago, at University of California, and University of Paris. And she's a life, lifelong fungal enthusiast, I think is fair to say, uh, but is currently um, at the University of Colorado, Denver, in the Department of Integrative Biology. Uh, so she's interested in the ecology and evolution of fungal communities, uh, and particularly in what drives diversity in these communities. Uh, so she's going to speak to us today about uh, fungal diversity from community to genes, and i um, delighted to hand over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And sorry, too many screens in front of me. Um, all right. So first, thank you so much for having me. It's such a great pleasure to uh, talk to three people. Uh, I'm used to talk to more to fungal people. And I'm so excited to be here because I want to pick your brains about a lot of things. And so I'm, I'm really also looking forward to the questions that you might have. Um, I'm also gonna say that I'm finishing up a flu, so I might cough, I apologize for that. I'm so glad we're remote because I'm not gonna infect anyone. <laughs> but I'm, I might have to take some sips of water and cough a little bit. And again, I apologize in advance for that. <clears throat> and so so today, when I was preparing this talk, I wasn't sure how to, how to frame it because I didn't know what community genomics was. <laughs> and, um, and so I decided uh, to talk a little bit about my path in uh, um, in being interested in in fungal diversity, and so that's why my talk is called "Fungal Diversity from Communities to Genes." And hopefully, by the end, you're going to understand, you know, what was the thought process and the kind of the trajectory of my career. And hopefully, it will be a good illustration of how we can approach studying diversity at different biological scales. But I'm going to start by saying that we love forests. And I know I'm speaking, I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking to the choir, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir, um, and because all of you are interested in trees, and we all love forests. They're beautiful, they're green, they have trees, uh, and, uh, and we need them, right? And I assume that most of you, not all, because I know there's some mycologists in the audience, which I really appreciate, <laughs> but most of you, <laughs> when you think about forests, and when you walk into a forest, you think about trees or you think about the plants. So it's all about the green part of the forest, which is totally acceptable because there's a lot of trees in the forest. <laughs> but some of us, uh, when we walk into a forest, we think of fungi because the fact is uh, fungi are the hidden motors of, uh, of forests. Um, and they come in all different sizes and shapes. They some of them make these beautiful mushrooms that we see once in a while. They're mysterious. They come up and they go away. Um, they look weird. <laughs> they have different colors, different shapes, different tastes, different smells. Um, some are edible, some are not edible. Um, and, you know, I, as, as, as Stephen said, I'm a lifelong fungal enthusiast and I actually started uh, studying fungi when I was 16 years old. So I have to say that I don't know how to do anything else. So I'm I'm useless other than being a mycologist. <laughs> um, but the fact is that even though uh, we do see these structures and uh, and there are all these roles that fungi play in the uh, in ecosystems, for the most part, they look like this. Other than the yeasts, but let's let's forget about yeast for for a little bit. Uh, fungi, for the most part, live within their substrate. They make these filaments, uh, these networks of filaments called mycelium and phyllofilaments or hyphae that live, um, if we think about the forest, live underground or live in wood or decompose leaves uh, or infect 
you know, the pathogens, they infect uh, plants and animals or other fungi. And so studying um, fungi is not easy because you can't always see them. You can't see them. You don't know how many individuals you have without using a lot of technology. Um, so it makes it a little hard to study fungal diversity. They said, you know, fungi are special. And I know I'm biased because I love them. <laughs> but uh, even when, when we think about overall diversity and even conservation, we tend to think about animals and plants. Most people only think about animals and most people only think about vertebrates, actually. <laughs> but if we think about fungi, Fungi are a group that, in, that, that is hyper-diverse. So it encompasses a lot of, fun, uh, of, of species. The latest estimates are that there's up to 3.5 million species of fungi, out of which only around 10% are actually have been described. So this makes it really challenging <laughs> to, um, to make sense of this diversity and know what they're doing exactly and how, and how they evolved and what are, what are their roles in the ecosystems. And as I just said, they're cryptic because you know once in a while you can see some mushrooms, but the mushrooms that you see are only a small fraction of the whole community of fungi underground. And so uh, they're, you know, mushrooms are not a good uh, approach, like documenting fungal diversity by looking at mushrooms is not a good approach because you're gonna miss a lot of the, of the communities. Um, they said, they uh, fungi play really important roles in the establishment and maintenance of ecosystems and you know they encompass decomposers parasites and mycorrhizal fungi as just 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 mentioned and so if we don't even despite all i just said that it's hard to study them and there's a ton of them and it's just difficult that shouldn't stop us from, from trying to um to unveil their secrets because if we really want to understand ecosystems and forests in particular we need to understand fungi and how they're interacting with uh, uh, with plants to um, to make forests as we know them. And when we think about fungal communities, it becomes a little hairy because they're hard. They're hard to study. As I said, we can't see most of the fungi. We can't see them. We don't know what an individual is if, uh, unless we use population genetics approaches. Uh, and to make things even more fun, in a given community, the typical pattern is that you have a very, a very high diversity and the communities tend to be composed by many rare taxa. So you have this curve that I know it's typical for communities where you have a few species that are abundant and many that are, you have a long tail of species that are not that abundant, but this is taken to an extreme in fungi where many, it's, in many communities, uh, this tail of rarity is composed by uh, uh, by fungal, by, by species that are documented only once or twice. Um, and many times, not always, but many times this more abundant species are not that abundant. They occur like in a fourth of the sample that you collect. So this makes it, it's like, I think it's the equivalent of studying a tropical forest in the Amazon where you, kn where you know that there's a gazillion different tree species and it makes it really, really hard to, uh, to make sense of that community dynamics and, and, and assembly. And we've known this, this pattern for a long time. This is nothing new. Uh, and even though technology has advanced and now we have better tools to try to tackle this, the problem is that the issue is still there. They're still diverse and weird. And so that makes it a little hard to, uh, yeah, as I said, to actually make sense of fungal diversity. And I've been focusing on ectomycorrhizal for a while. Um, so ectomycorrhizal fungi, uh, as Jess just mentioned, are uh, plant mutualists or plant symbionts. Uh, they uh, associate with plant roots and provide water and nutrients and receive carbohydrates in return. And I'm showing the same picture that Jess had with a pine, uh, a pine seedling growing in a, in a greenhouse on a cone. And what we have is a root system that is colonized by, uh, in this case, a spillus species. If we look at the same scenario, but instead of in soil, we grow the pine seedling in a petri dish to make it easier to see how, how the fungus grows, what we see is that uh, the, this fuzziness around the, uh, the root of this pine seedling is a, a spillus species, in this case, it's spillus luteus. And then on the short roots, what happens is that the fungus completely wraps the, the root, so the root has no more root hairs. And uh, if you do a cross section of that root, this is what you're gonna see in this picture. <coughs> 
excuse me, here in the in the bottom part of the slide, where these big cells are the plant cells, um, and these wiggly little cells are the fungal cells. And basically, what happens is that you have this layer that covers the outside of the root, but then the cells also go, the fungal cells also go in between plant cells in a, a where there's the the area of exchange of nutrients and, and and sugars. And what's cool is when you go out and you look at your forests, you're going to have a gazillion fungi associated with their roots. And you have multiple fungi colonizing a single tree. Um, and you have this, this, the, uh, a single genet, so a single individual fungus colonizing multiple trees. And so there's there's this dynamics uh, underground that uh, shift on a sh relatively short period. So this these roots are not perennial, so they come and go, um, which makes it, uh, you know, a very... <laughs> so it, there's a below ground party, just so you know. So the next time you walk into a forest and you're looking at your beautiful trees, just think of, you know, all the action that is happening underneath your feet. Um, and so with this, we have all the questions, right? all the questions about fungi. Um, how are species distributed? We don't even know that. Uh, how do mycorrhizal fungi disperse? How far do they go? How do mycorrhizal mutualisms originate, evolve, and are maintained? Like how did how does this symbiosis happen, and uh, the, how does it evolve? How does it evolve? What are the benefits for the plant and the fungus? How does exactly does this work? Um, how do mycorrhizal partners influence each other's ecology and evolution? Do we have uh, fungi shaping the evolution of of trees and vice versa? If so, how? Uh, and how do environments in affect mycorrhizal partners? If you have a um, a shift in the environment, is it going to affect the, the plant and the fungus the same way or not? And if it doesn't, how, how does that work? And it, are there ways to predict how, uh, you know, how the ecology and evolution of, of these partners is gonna be? And so I've been having, I've been asking these questions for a long, long time and I still don't have answers. And I don't know if I ever will, <laughs> but we try, right? And so throughout my career, I've been a little obsessed with fungal diversity. So I started my, uh, I started doing science very early on when I was an, an undergrad, and I was fascinated by fungal diversity. One day, I just walked into a forest, and all the mushrooms were out, and I was shocked. Like, where do these come from? And so that's that's where it all started for me. It's like, why do we have so many species? Where do they come from? How are they maintained? Why do they go away when because you don't see mushrooms <laughs> all the time? Um, and so my interest started with with communities and overall <coughs> diversity, species diversity. And then, I hopefully this is gonna be clear throughout my talk, I realized that communities are hard. I mean, I just told you that, but you know, I, I felt it in my skin that how hard it is to study communities. And I realized that uh, maybe if we expand uh, looking at communities by looking at specific species and specific populations and specific genes, we can we can make more sense of fungal diversity. And so this means that I've been, you know, spanning a, a whole bunch of scales on fungal diversity to try to, you know, my 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 overall question has always been on the community levels, like where, uh, why do we have so many species and how are they maintained? But I then started studying species. Uh, populations and basically how populations are are uh, partitioned uh, across the landscape and going up to the genes and genomes. And the idea is to do full circle and go from communities to genes and from genes to communities in the hopes that maybe one day <laughs> we will basically understand this weird cryptic organisms that are so important in uh, in nature. And so <laughs> for today, I basically prepared uh, three stories. So my talk is going to have three parts. I'm going to start by talking about fungal communities, and I'll talk about a specific set of studies that I did on fungal diversity in serpentine soils. Uh, and this is work that I did for my PhD. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental adaptation and how I, why I switched from fungal communities to studying populations. And I'll give you two, uh, a very brief, uh, 
sorry, about local adaptation in a specific species called Swillus brevipes. And then I'll switch to talk about metal tolerance in Swillus luteus. And this is going to give you more context for what just, uh, just presented. And then I'm going to finish up with uh, why, why I decided to uh, team up with a lot of friends to establish the Swillus Consortium. Um, and the Swillus Consortium is a little bit similar to your evil tree uh, uh, group, even though it's a little it's smaller <laughs> and we don't have money. But the idea is to um, gather resources uh, and expertise to, to develop a model system to understand mycorrhizal, uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so we've been doing a series of studies that um, that hopefully will allow will allow us to uh, have a better sense of this continuum of uh, diversity from communities to genes. And so I'm uh, within this topic. I'm going to talk a little bit about genome evolution, host specificity, and biological introductions. And so let me start with fungal diversity on serpentine soils. And as I said, this is a this is work that I've done many years ago. I'm not going to say how many. You're going to see because. The papers are dated. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, the, the main idea was, let's focus on one system and try to make sense of the diversity of that system. And I chose serpentine soils because they're special. And for those who don't know what serpentine soils are, um, they are soils that derive from rocks that come from the mantle of the earth. And so that have a different, chem different chemical composition from the rocks, from the crust. And so the soils that derive from these rocks have a weird chemistry. They tend to have low calcium to magnesium ratios. They're high in heavy metals, including nickel, chromium, and cadmium. And so uh, people have been, especially botanists, have been interested in serpentine soils for a long time because they tend to have low plant productivity in different vegetation from the surrounding areas. So you do not need to be a botanist or even a biologist to understand that serpentine soils are special. So in this picture, what I'm showing you is the boundary between serpentine and non-serpentine soil. And you can see that the, 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 the plant species that you find on each uh, uh, soil type are very different. And the serpentine, the serpentine one looks very, way more sparse and drier. And uh, and if you are to look into the plants that, are, that live here, they're gonna be completely different from the plants that live in the non-serpentine soil. And so we also know that uh, serpentine soils have specialized flora. So there's a lot of plant endemism and there's lots of examples of local adaptation associated with serpentine soils, uh, including plants that are hyperaccumulators. So here I'm showing you Alisum serp serpilifolium, which is a, a, a little <coughs> a little plant that grows in in serpentine soils and that accumulates nickel in its vacuoles. And so the uh, people describe their their leaves as nickel bombs because there's the the content of nickel is so high on their leaves that it makes them actually toxic to. Uh, uh, to herbivores and uh, and it's just fascinating how they can uh, deal with such high concentrations of nickel inside their tissues. And so with this, what I asked was, are serpentine soils a barrier for mycorrhizal fungi? And my hopes were that by studying, <coughs> excuse me, by studying a, um, a system that was harsh, that we would decrease fungal diversity. And so I was expecting to find uh, a, a lower, uh, a fewer species uh, of mycorrhizal fungi. And that would allow me to actually understand the communities better than just having this like, you know, um, uh, gazillion species that are all rare. And so uh, I had a lot of questions when I started my, my project. Uh, first was, is there low serpentine fungal diversity? And as I said, I was hoping that there were because it's there's nickel and cadmium and chromium, so the fungi shouldn't want to be to live there. Um, the other question was: Is there a specialized serpentine fungal community? Meaning, um, do we see? Excuse me. Do we see uh, a set of species that are only associated with with serpentine? And to make it more fun, what I really wanted was to find serpentine specific uh, species or clades, and maybe there would be fungal radiations associated with serpentine soil. How cool would that be? Because these soils are, are old. So there, there has been enough time for that to happen. Uh, and the overall question was, do fungi follow the same plant patterns of serpentine adaptation or not? 
<laughs> and so to um, uh, to answer these questions, I uh, chose to do uh, field work in my home country. I'm from, I'm from Portugal, and uh, in the northeast part, north, northeastern part of Portugal, um, there are a lot of serpentine patches. Uh, and what's cool about them is that they're colonized by Quercus ilex. Uh, uh, but, but this Quercus ilex is, not, ilex is not specific to serpentine soils. So this means that you, within the same geographic region, you have monospecific forests of Quercus ilex uh, growing on serpentine and on non-serpentine soil, which is the ideal set uh, setup for testing the effects of soil on the mycorrhizal fungi that are associated with, with this uh, with these oaks. <clears throat> and so what I set out to do was first to describe the mycorrhizal fungal community. So just do a field survey, who lives there, compare serpentine and non-serpentine sites to have a sense of uh, uh, um, if the communities have more or less diversity in, on a specific soil type and if they're different uh, assemblages or not. And, uh, and so basically I just used uh, uh, molecular, molecular techniques and uh, I sequenced the ITS uh, uh, from serpentine and non-serpentine oak root samples. And then I went a little further and I did a, a greenhouse reciprocal transplant experiment where I was wanted to know how the fungi from serpentine and non-serpentine soil would react to being forced to be on the opposite soil type. And this is this was a little complicated because as I said, we can't really see the fungi. We don't know what an individual is. We don't know who's there. And so the, the way to, to do this was to grow little seedlings on the original soil, wait for the fungi to colonize the roots and then transplant the seedlings because the fungi are associated with the roots. And that way I don't need to know who's there to be able to set up the experiment. And then I can sequence them in the end and see uh, which fungi are present on serpentine and non-serpentine soil and in all of my treatments. And so very quickly, I'm gonna give you the results that I found. The overall take, take home message was serpentine soils do not limit uh, fungal diversity. So overall, they really don't care. Like fungi, it's like, give me the chromium and the cadmium and the, and the uh, and the nickel and the weird calcium to magnesium that it's fine. <laughs> so the first <laughs> graph that I'm showing you is just a rank abundance um, graph with uh, the species found on uh, serpentine and non-serpentine soils. And the first, uh, maybe the, the first thing that is glaringly obvious is that these curves are very similar and that we have many species that were found, found only once. And I have to say that even though there's some species that are abundant, this is only like a quarter of the samples that I, that I, uh, that I analyzed. Meaning that my hopes of getting a simplified system were completely <laughs> botched. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, so we have the typical uh, serpentine, uh, the typical fungal communities, uh, 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 both on serpentine and non-serpentine soil. So, Diverse communities on both soils, a lot of singletons, and to make it more fun, less than 15% species overlap. So it was like, great, the communities are very different, but are they different because, uh, oh, and I, I, I didn't put this on the slide, but I had replicates of each one of the forest types and the overlap, this low overlap was constant even within non-serpentine forests and with the, uh, 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 sorry, across non-serpentine forests and across serpentine forests, which tells me that there's just too many fungi, basically. And then I wanted to know that that uh, <laughs> if there were specific uh, species specifically associated with, with serpentine and this idea of radiation. So it, were there any clades that are uh, found only on serpentine? And so long, long story short, ask me later if you want to know more about this. What I did was I put all my fungi on a phylogenetic tree. This was not trivial because we have two phyla and I have a marker that is at the species level so you can't align them. So I had to do all these tricks to be able to get a meaningful tree with, with branch links. Ask me later if you wanna know about this. But, so I'm showing you a tree that has all the, um, all the species that I found on my communities uh, of micro ectomycorrhizal fungi. And the branches in red, are the species that were found on serpentine soils. The wrenches in black are the species that are found on non-serpentine soils. And the stars are the few species that were found on both. And 
when you look at this tree, it's not clear at all that you have clades that are associated with serpentine, right? You don't have red clades only. And so all my grandiose expectations of finding this serpentine clades and serpentine endemics uh, uh, on, on fungi, again, were not uh, fulfilled at all. And then for my, uh, my pot experiment, <laughs> what I also found was that there was actually higher diversity associated with serpentine treatments. Uh, so whenever I have uh, uh, serpentine treatment involved in the, in the experiment, there's gonna be more fungi than, than not. And I found no evidence for fungal specialization at the species level. There were two species that had slight preferences. So we'd find them a little bit more on one soil or the other, but no idea, no, no evidence whatsoever of fungal specialization. So <laughs> coming back to my questions, is there low serpentine fungal diversity? No. Is there a specialized serpentine fungal community? No, <laughs> because you have so, such little overlap and because there's so much turnover across individual forests, it's really hard to know. Uh, in the end, it's like all, all, all communities are different. Uh, and so it's hard to know if they're different because of serpentine or it's just different because there's too many fungi out there. And based on these data, uh, can we say that uh, fungi follow the same plant patterns of serpentine adaptation? No. Why? I don't know. And I obsessed about this. <laughs> so this, I basically just summarized six years of my life in a few slides. And after when I was finishing my PhD, I had I was doing all these soul searching. It's like, how can we understand this 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 organism? It's like I can't, I don't know. I, I don't I don't I don't know what else to do <laughs> other than keep on we can keep on documenting, but if we find all this um if the if in the end we always find this hyper diverse communities, uh, what can we say about them? And so it was, I had this crisis in my life where it's like I don't I don't know where to go now, and so one of the one of the ideas that I had at the time was well maybe maybe the specialization or maybe the the difference is going to be below the species level you know somehow maybe what we're what we're going to see in fungi is that it's not you're not going to have a species specificity, but maybe we're going to have uh, change or differences at a finer scale. And so my hopes were <clears throat> maybe if I understand fungal populations, I can make sense of fungal communities. And so after this, <clears throat> as one does, I just decided to you know, keep on studying fungi, but shift my uh, my approach. And, you know, there were a few years, maybe two or three, where it's like, I don't want to deal with communities anymore. I hate them, <laughs> cannot understand them. This makes no sense whatsoever. So let's try and look at population genetics, because maybe that's where the the uh, <laughs> the key is to understand this, uh, this fungi. And so that's when I switched to in more um, focusing more on environmental adaptation at the species at the population level, or below the species level, and so the main questions that I was interested in uh, were: Are there phenotypic differences across individuals that are living in distinct in distinct uh, environments? And are there genomic signatures of selection? So maybe maybe fungi just deal with stress in a different way than, than plants, for example. And so maybe what we're gonna see is uh, these differences below the species level. And this is when I, uh, when I switch to focusing, focus on uh, single species studies. And when I, when I became a postdoc at the University of California in Berkeley, uh, I picked the genus Willis to study. And the reason for that is that it's a very abundant uh, genus that associates with uh, uh, conifers. And it includes pioneer species <laughs> being very important for the establishment of temperate forests. And more important than that, it's easy to find because in the fruits, it's all over. Um, and it's very amenable for laboratory experiments as, as Jess <laughs> just mentioned. And so I decided, okay, let's focus on one group and see if we can make sense of, of, of the species in this group. And then maybe we can zoom back and try to incorporate that, that information on a more community uh, level. And so I set myself to study the genetic basis of Swiss environmental adaptation. 
And so what I wanted to know was if environment shapes Willis interspecific genetic diversity, and if yes, how so? And to do this, I moved away from documenting communities and from doing, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse transplant experiment, <laughs> experiments um, to using tools like genome resequencing and scans for selection, uh, candidate gene identification and validation, phenotypic assays. And I really wanted to know what, what was the role of Swillis adaptation on tree health and survival? Because, you know, I'm a mycologist, I care about the fungi, but you know, there's a partner and it would be really, really <coughs> important to understand how the plant and the uh, and the fun and the fungi are interacting. And so my first uh, attempt to understand the genetic basis of, of environmental adaptation in Swillis <coughs> was with a study on local adaptation in Swillis brevipes. And Swillis brevipes is a uh, this size, uh, tiny, smallish uh, mushroom that is very common in uh, in North America. Um, it looks, it has this, when it's young, it's beautiful because it looks like it has a chocolate cap. When it's old, it's gross. <laughs> it's full of maggots and it's slimy, it's horrendous. So better young than, than old in this case. <laughs> um, and what we decided to do was, because we didn't, we took a blind approach, more of a reverse ecology approach. And we we decided to collect a bunch of uh, uh, of isolates across North America and just see, are they different populations? And if they are different populations, what is structuring them? And so for this, we used <coughs> uh, whole genomes. Uh, we compared whole genomes across, uh, across multiple sites. And what we found was that in North America, there's multiple populations. So each one of these dots shows a population and this is the Pacific Ocean and Lake Michigan. So you know, the, the Rocky Mountains here in the middle. Um, and what was interesting is that uh, it was clear that this population was actually structured by climate and some other abiotic parameters. And when I looked at the populations in California, these two, this red and pink ones, what I found is that the populations in the coastal areas and in the montane areas, they share genetic variation, so they're they're different, but they're not super differentiated. But what's cool is that the the highest differentiation they have in, across their genomes include this uh, sodium hydrogen exchanger that is known to be involved in salt tolerance. So the hypothesis here is that uh, the coastal environment has higher salt content than in the mountains because it's closer to the ocean, and that might be what is driving the divergence of these two populations. And so this was great because it allowed me to, you know, learn population genomics, learn how to code, learn how to deal with genomes. Um, but in the meantime, because, you know, grants finish and then you have to move on <laughs> and, and figure out, you know, what your next steps are. And when I, when I got my first job uh, as an assistant professor, um, I decided to start studying metal tolerance in Swillis. And as Jess just, uh, just mentioned, there's this system uh, uh, in Swillis Lurius that has been studied for a long time, uh, uh, mainly in Belgium. And why in Belgium? Because this, this species is the dominant species associated with pines in smelter areas of Belgium. And these are soils that are contaminated with zinc, cadmium, and other metals. And so when I started my first lab, um, I hired a very, very talented postdoc, Dr. Dr. Uh, Anna Batika Lukupo, to basically um, unveil the genetic basis of metal tolerance in Swillus studios. <clears throat> and let me give you a little bit more information on this species. So what we realized, what my collaborators realized a long time ago is that some Swillus studios individuals display metal tolerance. So it's not, metal tolerance is not a species wide trait. Some individuals are tolerant and some are not. And here I'm showing you a growth assay similar to what Jess showed you uh, few minutes ago, where we have a Swillus luteus from contaminated soil and another one from non-contaminated soil growing in a zinc gradient. And what I hope it's obvious is that the isolate from contaminated soil is completely unbothered by high zinc concentrations, while the one from non-contaminated soil cannot tolerate high, high levels of zinc. What's really interesting is that when we look at the metal intake, the zinc intake of these isolates, though the the isolate from contaminated soil, this one that is tolerant, actually is able to 
uh, regulates the metal intake, intake much better than the, uh, the non-tolerant and can withstand much higher concentrations of, of metal in their cells. So there's this clear difference in phenotype, not only in growth, but how they, th these isolates are dealing with, uh, with zinc. And so the question was, is Willis Ludius metal tolerance genetically determined? So are there, is there genetic differentiation and are there specific regions of the genome that account for these differences in phenotype? Um, and so the sub-questions we had in this project were, is there a population structure across contaminated and non-contaminated soils? It would make sense to have these two gene pools that were locally adapted to these different environments because after all, Heavy metals are toxic, and if you live in a toxic place, I mean, if you live in a toxic place, it's reasonable to expect that there you underwent some kind of adaptation to be able to withstand uh, that environment. Then we ask, are, um, is there genomic differentiation across individuals from distinct soil types? So do we see any differences in the genes uh, uh, across uh, contaminated and non-contaminated sites. So to basically understand what are the what is the, the true genetic basis of this of this phenotype. And then the last question is how does this metal tolerance in Swilla Studius affect the tree partner? Does it matter? How so? Um, and so basically what we did is that we, we gathered individuals from several areas in uh, in Belgium, in this Lim Limburg district, and we had three sites that are close to uh, zinc smelters that are now decommissioned, and three sites that are clean. Uh, and the first, so we, we got the... Uh, the genome sequences, and we compared them, we lined them to the reference genome, and we called uh, SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, to, to, to basically to uh, try to understand the differences across them. And the first result we got was that there was no there is no population structure between metal tolerant and non-tolerant Phyllis Ludius, which was very surprising. And again, like showed me humility in how I am very often wrong in my hypotheses, <laughs> and I'm sure many of you can, can relate to that. And so basically what I'm showing you here is an ordination plot with uh, uh, individual genomes as circles. The circles that are closed come from um, uh, polluted sites. The uh, uh, circles that are open come from non-polluted sites. And there is no clear partitioning of, uh, 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 of these individuals, right? They're basically just all intermingled, which tells us that there's, uh, there is gene flow. And it's not shocking because if you look at the, the spatial scale we're talking about, a uh, few less than 20, uh, 20 to 50 kilometers. And this, this species is wind dispersed. So it's not, there's no bear, there's no ocean, there's no mountain in between this, this site. So it's not shocking that they're actually exchanging genes. What we also found was that metal tolerance is polygenic, meaning that is determined by many alleles of small defects, which is not super surprising because uh, you can imagine that responding to toxicity, metal toxicity involves different parts of the physiology of an organism. And when we looked at the, the differentiated genes between uh, swillus that is from contaminated and non-contaminated sites, we found that the differentiated genes, many differentiated genes fall, fell into um, the categories of metal exclusion, immobilization, and detoxification, which makes sense. Um, and with this, we did a, a small model uh, we came up with a model of how Swilla Studios deals with with heavy metals. And so, you know, mycology 101 for all of you that don't remember your, your fungal biology. Uh, this is representing uh, the tip of a hypha. So this is a cell compartment. If you remember, fungi have apical growth. They grow only at the tip of, their, of a, a specific filament. Um, they have two nuclei because they can. <laughs> so the the... the the genome is, is separated into two nuclei. And if we imagine that this is, is, is a, a, a hypha from uh, uh, Swillus cluteus growing on uh, contaminated soil and that these little diamonds are metals, um, the way this species deals with the metals is by having this uh, metal transmembrane transporters, both on the plasma membrane and in the organelles. Then there are chelating agents. There's are basically just molecules that grab the metals and immobilize them. And they have them both inside the cell and outside the cell, which is really cool to see. And they have antioxidants that basically neutralize the toxicity of metals uh, inside the soil. Um, so this was 
very cool to to document and gave us a little bit more insight on how this fungus is dealing with this uh, with uh, this harsh environment. But then we wanted to know uh, how about the tree? Does it matter? Uh, does it uh, do, does does the metal tolerant swillus influence in any way uh, the the pine trees? And we we knew <laughs> excuse me we knew from previous uh, uh, assays that when you grow a, a, a seedling with a tolerant uh, um, isolate and you water it with metal, that many times the seedlings do better when they have the tolerant isolates than than when the tolerant isolate, uh, fungus is not present. But we didn't know exactly how the mechanisms were, how exactly the um, the metals were distributed in the in the root context. And so we we conducted a small experiment uh, where we grew seedlings in the greenhouse in soil with a, um, a metal tolerant swillus and without swillus. And we found that swillus luteus actually regulates pine, uh, pine root zinc uptake. And so here I'm showing you uh, X-ray microscopy uh, um, images of pine roots that are inoculated with a zinc tolerant uh, swillus luteus and roots that are not inoculated. And what I hope it's obvious is that uh, when zinc is low, swillus is actually actively uh, bringing zinc towards the edge of the root. So this is a cross section of the root where if you remember the weakly parts of the fungus are on the outside of the root. Um, and when, the, when uh, zinc is very high uh, and the fungus is present, there's no high zinc inside in the pith of the, of the, of the root. But when the, the fungus is absent, there's high zinc concentration in the middle of the root, which we can uh, uh, suspect that it's toxic for the plant. So this makes us suspect that the, 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 the fungus is actually acting as a barrier for the zinc in intake for the plant. We're, um, we're now expanding this, this experiment and I'll talk, talk about them a little bit more in a, in a minute. So if we go back to the questions <laughs> about uh, as well as uh, luteus metal tolerance, is there a population across uh, population structure across contaminated non contaminated soils? No, there isn't. Is there genomic differentiation across the, diff the different soil types? Yes, there is, even though there's no population uh, differentiation, there are a set of genes that are differentiated and that seems seem to be very involved in the uh, uh, in being able to tolerate metals. And does Willis luteus metal tolerant impact tree partners? Yes, it does. And it seems to be maybe more, even more important than we thought mycorrhizal fungi were because it can act, <coughs> excuse me, as a barrier for uh, uh, plant metal intake. Intake. So within this project, we have a lot of things that we want to do next. And uh, we am ha very happy to say that we have funding for, from both the National Science Foundation and from the Joint Genome Institute uh, here in the US to pursue these projects. And we're currently doing candidate gene validation using both gene expression, and we're trying to develop gene editing protocols. Jess, I'm counting on you <laughs> to develop these protocols. It's easier said than done. Uh, we are um, also investigating metal tolerance in other species, and that's what uh, what Jess uh, showed you in the beginning. And uh, we're expanding uh, all the work that I showed you is with a, a, a European fungus, but we're interested in uh, uh, in how metal tolerance uh, evolved in the in North America, and we hope to do a comparative study uh, on you know. Um, on if there was convergent evolution or not of uh, uh, approaches to deal with heavy metals. And then we want to continue investigating the role of metal tolerance willis in tree survival. So we have that experiment that uh, Jess just mentioned. She didn't say it, but she just got a, a, a JGI grant as a lead PI. So I'm very proud of her. And we're so happy that we'll be able to uh, uh, analyze all the, uh, all the samples that we've been uh, generating. And so, so this is, so this has been all nice and great, right? So I, I told you about communities and my fascinating by my fascination by uh, fungal diversity, my frustration with <laughs> fungal diversity, my other attempt to understand uh, how fungi operate at a different biological scale. Turns out that it's more complicated <laughs> than I wanted because I wanted clear patterns so I could go back to the communities and like, all right, this all now all makes sense. Um, and so within this confusion, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and you know, by talking to a lot of other people that are interested in uh, in mycorrhizal fungi and in Swillas in particular, um, we decided to join forces to form this Swillas consortium. And the Swillas consortium is just a, a group of uh, of scientists that are interested in advancing uh, uh, the knowledge of ectomycorrhizal fungi using Swillas as a model. Um, and why Swillas? As I just told you, you know, it's it's uh, a, a, a group that is actually very amenable for in vitro manipulation, which makes it a powerful for testing hypotheses. But it also is a diverse genus um, and widespread in temperate uh, in temperate forests, and it has around 100 species. And it shows actually very strong host specificity, which is not common in mycorrhizal fungi, at least in ectomycorrhizal fungi. It's mainly associated with the pinaceae. And so the goal of the Swillus Consortium is to develop Swillus in into an ectomycorrhizal model uh, model system by integrating aspects in, the, in systematics, ecology, and evolution, and genomics. And hopefully, again, to advance the knowledge of mycorrhizal fungi in general, and then hopefully team up with people like you in the audience so we can actually understand ecosystems in a much you know consistent and accurate way. And so, as one does, you just grab all your friends <laughs> and, and and come up with ways to plot to take over the world. <laughs> and so I'm very happy that I was able to collaborate with all these people from very different institutions to uh, to start this this consortium. Um, and I'm proud to say that now we have uh, uh, 19 uh, PIs uh, across seven countries involved in the Swiss consortium and uh, looking at very different aspects of, of the genus. And so the first thing that we do, we did was to improve genomic resources for the for the genus. And so we got support, a lot of support from the Joint Genome Institute to compile reference genomes and annotations. And so now we're at over 40 uh, species, which is basically half of the genus. And what we have learned so far uh, is that there's huge genome size variation across the genus. And so here I'm showing you a graph that has the genome size uh, across different groups of fungi. So we have ectomycorrhizal, saprotrophs, pathogens, et cetera. And on the top part here, I have the, uh, the range of size of genomes across Swillus. And what I hope it's obvious is that Swillus has as much variation as most of all fungi. So it's weird, like why do they have, some species have very small genomes, some species have very, very big genomes, so why? And so, Dr. Lotus Lofgren, who is now a uh, postdoc uh, at Duke University, has been focusing a lot on understanding the, the genome evolution of, of, of Swillus. And what she found is that they have massively dynamic genomes. Um, they have more uh, gene family expansions and contractions than other mycorrhizal fungi, ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so here I'm just showing you a, a graph with the uh, gene families that are expanded and contracted in Swillus and other uh, species of ectomycorrhizal fungi, and it's clear that uh, they have more expansions and more contractions. They also have uh, a lot of core genes, so genes that are shared across the whole uh, species, across the whole genus, but they have a gazillion singletons, meaning that there's many species-specific genes, and we wonder why. <laughs> why. Why would there be such a big proportion of genes that are specific to one species? Um, and so this is ongoing work, and I, I hope uh, uh, I hope Lotus has a, a, a manuscript, uh, you know, out at some point this year, so we'll we'll know more a little bit more about this. But one way that we're that that she's been thinking about this data are through the lens of host specificity, and so. Um, she worked with Peter Kennedy, with Dr. Peter Kennedy at, at the University of Minnesota uh, before going to Duke. And they were very interested in understanding Swillus host specificity. And as I mentioned, Swillus is, very, is a very good example, or one of the few examples of host specificity in ectomycorrhizal fungi. And it associates specifically with Pinus, Clerics, and Pseudosuga. And one of the questions is like, how did the genus evolve to colonize these partners? How, how did that happen? And so Lotus grabbed a bunch of genomes that we, we generated, <laughs> compiled a, a, a genus level tree, and did ancestral state reconstruction to infer 
the evolution of, uh, of host specificity across the genus. And what she found was that uh, some groups, some clades of swillus uh, are specifically associated with uh, um, specific conifers, for example, uh, pseudothuga, white pines, or red pines. Uh, in that it seems that Larix was the most likely ancestral host, which is interesting because we always, I, at least when, when you go out and you look for swillus, you always think about pines. Um, and so I would always assume that pine would be the ancestor. But what's also interesting is that it seems that there have been multiple events, independent uh, switches between white and red pine hosts. So there's been this dynamic evolution of switching hosts uh, 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 through time. And what's also very cool is that host specificity seems to be associated with secondary metabolites and pathways involved in deactivation of reactive oxygen species. So if we look at secondary metabolite clusters across uh, swillus and compare them with other mycorrhizal fungi, uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi, what you see is that, for example, they have way more terpenes than others. Uh, and they also have this uh, more this NRPS-like uh, 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 clusters, which are also uh, just secondary uh, metabolite clusters. And so maybe maybe there's there's a hint of what is the mechanism for being able to uh, be specific to a, a, a tree, a tree species or a tree group. Uh, and also maybe this can explain, this can be tied up with why there's so many singleton genes across the uh, Swillus species. Another thing that was very interesting that we found was that uh, even though Swillus associates with Pinus laris and Pseudotsuga, it can also associate with Picea and Aedes, but requires a known host to germinate the spores. And so <clears throat> the Peter Kennedy's lab uh, conducted this, this uh, study using Swillus condylosus, uh, where they exposed the, the fungus to different hosts to see if they would colonize the roots or not. And what they found was that the roots were only colonized when Larix, which is the original host of this uh, of this species, uh, was present. If Abies was not present, there were no colonization of roots of Abies or Picea. But if Larix, if there was a mix of plant hosts, if there was Larix and Abies or Larix and Picea, then the the roots of both were colonized. So this gives us hints on how complicated the systems can be. So uh, host specificity uh, is more than just can you associate with a, with a plant or not. In this case, you also, <laughs> you also need to be able to germinate your spores to be able to, to establish. So it makes it this community approach a little bit more complicated. Another topic that we uh, looked into are biological introductions and thinking about you know, how, how species move around the world. And pines and swillus are native to the northern hemisphere, but have been widely, widely introduced in the northern hemisphere. And so one of the questions was, how did that happen? And this is work uh, done by Dr. Uh, Yi Hong Ke um, in the lab of uh, Virus Vilgalis at Duke University. And so what, what he noticed is that swillus luteus, which is the same species that I just mentioned, the metal tolerance, uh, um, is actually the most wide widespread species in the genus. So it basically was introduced in many, many places. And the question is how, how did it happen? And so what, <laughs> what Dr. K did was compile whole genomes for 274 fruiting bodies from across the world. So he has samples from six continents and he sequenced all these genomes to try to understand how they moved around. Um, and this also ties into this idea of uh, invasive pines because they are a big problem, especially in the southern hemispheres. Like, how do they ex uh, how do they expand, especially because they're obligate ectomycorrhizal fungi, and so um, the the fungi have to be present for for pines to be able to expand. Um, and so, very quickly, I'm showing you a tree that I know is has very small font, but it's okay. Um, that includes all this over 200 uh, genomes across the world. And what uh, Dr. K found was that there was one big clade that includes all the samples from Central Europe where the, the species originates, Africa, North America, New Zealand, Australia, and South America. And then there were some other clades <laughs> in Northern Europe, Asia, and then there was a, a, an outgroup. And what this 
tree tells us is that Central Europe is likely the source of introductions, which is not shocking because that's where the species comes from. But what's interesting is that South America, Australia, and New Zealand were colonized, <coughs> excuse me, seem to have been colonized only once. That was one event of colonization. But North America has been colonized multiple times. So North America is here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. So there's been so many times that Swillus has been introduced, which is so very interesting. And the Asian, the Asian and Northern Europe clade <coughs> actually seem to be a different species. So that's more for the as well as uh, experts to uh, tease out. But you know, if we focus on this bigger clay that is truly Swillus luteus, we can uh, understand better how, how it moved around. Um, so he also did demographic models to understand how the species uh, uh, um, spread out. And uh, the demographic model supported this idea, <laughs> this hypothesis of multiple introductions to North America uh, from uh, from Europe, one introduction to um, South Africa, South America. And what's interesting in, in the uh, down under is that it seems like Sulis went to New Zealand first and then secondarily colonized Australia. Um, and uh, and so now the the question is it, this is still work in progress, but one of the, the questions that uh, that uh, Yi Hong is is asking is, are there any genomic signatures? of these populations that have been uh, introduced <coughs> to know if there's a if there's an introduction prone uh, phenotype is there any genetic predis predisposition for swillas to be able to move around more than uh, 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 in in some populations than other so you know stay stay tuned hopefully we'll have a a draft of a manuscript for that soon and so to kind of summarize uh, you know, all these things that I've been telling you, I'm going back to my outline. And so I, I told you a story about fungal communities and uh, and about fungal diversity on serpentine soils and how this was, you know, one of my introductions to the messy world of uh, <laughs> fungal diversity. Then I moved on to tell you about environmental adaptation in my own frustration of not understanding fungal communities and moving to fungal populations to maybe try to make sense of them, of, of the whole uh, um, uh, assemblages. And then I, I finished by telling you about the Swillus Consortium, which is, again, which is again another effort to gather more information so we can make sense of the whole biology of ectomycorrhizal fungi, including uh, community diversity. So where do we want to go next? In my lab, I'm very, very interested in the genetic basis of adaptation. So I want to pursue uh, studies on the mechanisms of adaptation, exactly how fungi are able to adapt to, the, to, the, uh, to their environment and patterns of convergent adaptation. So when we have uh, the evolution of phenotypes uh, in different uh, continents, in this case, in, the, in North America and in Europe, do we see the same patterns of, uh, of, uh, of adapting to one uh, same um, selective pressure, for example, metals uh, in the soil? We also just got funding from the Joint Genome Institute to study fungal interactions. This is a, a grant that was just funded, and uh, Lotus Greffen is the is the lead PI. And the 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 main goals are to understand fungal competition and fungal host communication. So this brings starts bringing this back more to the communities. And uh, for fungal competition is basically just understanding how fungi are interacting uh, and using this synthetic communities to try to tease out uh, uh, aspects of uh, genomics, transcriptomics, and metabolomics, and communication between fungi when they're interacting, but also how the, the, the fungi communicate with the host, and kind of going back to this idea of uh, how, how adaptation leads to changes in the plants too. So hopefully, one day, we will be able to look at all these uh, uh, scales of diversity, uh, community species, populations, and genes and genomes to try to really make sense of fungal diversity, and finally understand the forest that we all know and love. And um, my b b before I finish, my pledge is we need tree people because <laughs> we 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 think a lot, we get so bogged down and thinking and uh, uh, and distracted with all the challenges of fungi that sometimes we 
we think of trees as carbon pumps and that's it. Like they, they exist just to feed our fungi and that there's, that's the role that they have. And they do more than that, right? So it would be great to be able to join forces and have a little bit of the counterparts to the, the symbiosis that we're studying. And with this, I wanna say thank you to a gazillion people, uh, all my collaborators, obviously my lab, you know, cause it's great to come here and just tell you about all those, those results, but I don't do most of it, unfortunately. Uh, and so all these people have been very proactive in, in gathering uh, data. And of course, funding sources and the National Science Foundation and the Joint Genome Institute have been fundamental, uh, crucial for uh, um, for allowing me to um, you know implement my, my research program. And I thank you and I'll take any questions that you'd like. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was uh, really interesting. Lots there. <laughs> and well done for uh, battling the remnants of your flu. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sorry that I'm coughing. Struggle. No, thank you very much. That was superb. Um, well, I'll just uh, go straight ahead and open the floor to anybody who has questions. I'm sure there'll be some. Would anybody like to go first? <laughs> I have to say that everything you've said confirms everything that I I understand about <laughs> working with mycorrhizas and uh, trying to get them to do what you want. As we had some, we did some common garden work looking for local adaptations in mycorrhizal communities and could find none, but but did find very strong sort of a heritability for a response to the mycorrhizal community. So the the you know there is definitely an association within populations for particular families to associate with particular mycorrhizal groups but uh, it's hard uh, to <laughs> interpret that in terms of adaptation to an environment is uh, was very tricky yeah um, ben please yeah thank you very much for your interesting talk it was really inspiring um i have a first question about the pan genome project you mentioned at the very end of your talk mm -hmm. um you are sequencing different species of Sulius, but are you considering sequencing several genomes of one particular species that is involved in the Sepontin uh, adaptation? So that's a very good question. So let's step back. And I didn't make this clear, but the Serpentine uh, project uh, involved oaks. Swillus does not uh, occur in oak forests, so oak is not a... Um, uh, a swillus associate. So I wouldn't be able to study swillus from the, the serpentine forest that I studied. So what to, to give you like a context of in terms of you know career paths, I did my my dissertation, my PhD dissertation in uh, um, uh, my field sites were in Portugal. And then when I did when I moved to California, I was in a grant that was focused on North America. So I had to switch systems. And because there's so many pine forests, that's why I started to study pine associates. In between, I really wanted to look for a local adaptation to serpentine in a specific spe in specific species from that serpentine uh, um, uh, sites that I studied before. And I tried, I was trying to focus on one Lacaria species. It's just a, a small, uh, uh, small mycorrhizal fungus uh, that seemed to have a little bit more preference to serpentine. So I thought, well, maybe this is going to be, but also occurs in non-serpentine. So I thought, well, maybe this is going to be a good candidate to study the genomics of uh, of serpentine adaptation. But then reality hits that I could not grow it in culture. So Lacaria has, it's actually a good reason. Lacaria, it seems like Lacaria has a lot of endosymbiotic bacteria. So when you try to grow it in a petri dish, all you grow is, are the bacteria that live inside it. <laughs> so I tried for months and I was so frustrated. I was like, you know what? I give up, <laughs> move on to do something else. And so that's why I started also working. So when I started working on Swillus and then I got uh, access to this, uh, I started collaborating with the, the, this teams in, in Belgium that had all this data on Swillus luteus. That's why we shifted to study uh, uh, Swillus luteus and looking at metal tolerance in Swillus. Going back to your question about sequencing many isolates or many individuals from the same species, that's a very good question. So our original Swillus Consortium grant 
was to have reference genomes and annotations across the genus. So we were targeting one isolate per species. And then we had a side, like a, a little part of that grant that focused on resequencing many genomes of Swilus luteus, right? Because the idea would be then to compare, to be able to do these genome scans. Um, so one of the issues that when we do resequencing, if you do light coverage, uh, you, you don't have an annotation in an assembly per individuals per se, right? So what I wanna do right now is, I'm currently writing an, a, a proposal for that, is to request funds to deep sequence many individuals, both uh, metal tolerant and non-tolerant. So we can do a pan-genome analysis associated with metal tolerance, but also, because I want, I want to do more than that, we want to look at structural variation, because sometimes it's more, it can be chunk, big chunks of chromosomes that come and go. And if you do not have very, very high coverage and high quality genomes, you can't, you, you're not able to, to detect those areas. So in a nutshell, it's a great idea. It's on the way. Hopefully we'll get the money to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> Martina, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this really inspiring talk. And uh, just to say, I think the only time I saw the, the species richness of ectomycorrhizal um, species uh, decrease was with nitrogen deposition. That's the only maybe there we should try to understand this community better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now for my question, I was very intrigued by your um, generalist specialist um, studies that you did with, uh, within the Suilus. And there, I, I didn't, I was not sure I'm, whether I understand correctly. So only when you put larix uh, together with a non-host species, then you would have the colonization of both. And you think it's because only then the spores were growing? Yes, because when you when they did the, you can go and get the, 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 it's a, the, the, the paper is published. So if you want details, you can go and mm -hmm. see, see the details. But from my recollection, what it is that they, they added spores to the, co the, the, the cones where the seedlings were. Mm -hmm. And so the spores had to germinate in order to be able to establish, right? And so if you, if you add spores to uh, cones that don't have larynx, you never see the roots colonize. You only see roots colonize both of abbeys and larynx when larynx is present. Mm -hmm. So that is a good indication that the fungus, that that specific species needs the larynx to be able to germinate the spores. Mm -hmm. But it's not that he can't associate with yes. the other, but, but, but the problem, and it's fascinating, but the problem is uh, how, how do we account for this when we're doing you know, our community surveys and trying to understand our communities? Like, how do we, how do we know if there was a larynx before or not, right? <laughs> so if we don't have these targeted species for each, uh, as targeted studies for each species, then it becomes really hard to really make sense of, of what's going on. And when you have hundreds of species, you can't do targeted species for all of them, right? It's like, it's not, you need, you need unlimited funding and unlimited people. So, so yeah. So instead of, and I confess that sometimes I just want to curl up and cry and just give up, <laughs> but you know, that's not a good, a good, a good option. So it's like, you do what you can and you start by doing these small projects and kind of piecing it out, uh, join the pieces together. Okay, thank you very much. And don't give I up. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Tom, you are for next. Uh, yes, uh, I'm curious at just how important Sue Willis is to larch and pine. Uh, I mean, how important, without Sue Willis, how would those, those trees do? And then it sounds like um, larch, facilitates the acquisition uh, uh, of pine. And so uh, what does that say about the community of trees and how dependent they are upon one another to acquire these mutualists? I think you need to actually show that the trees really benefit though. Yes, and so when we do have, there are studies showing like, you know, growth rates and plant health with the presence and absence of, of specific species. And uh, one can all also uh, 
one can also do plant seedlings in the fields and then look at their roots and see, you know, com compare uh, uh, perform plant performance and also associate that with the with, with the fungi that are on the roots. Those are all good questions that are hard to answer. Uh, it's hard to give you a straight answer because, you know, if you ask how dependent are pinus on swillus, it's going to depend on the the rest of the fungal community because swillus is not the only gen genus that colonizes uh, pine uh, pine roots, even though it's very prevalent and you you always find swillus in in pine forests. And when you look at the roots, you find uh, roots that are colonized with uh, lots of roots that are colonized with uh, with swillus species. But um, there are other members of the community that associate with pine. So the only way we can answer how important the the swillus is for the pines is by doing um, uh, this greenhouse assays where you reduce the community. Because if you have 300 species living underground uh, that can associate with, with the pines, it becomes a little hard to know exactly what the relevance uh, of each species is. And my guess is that it's going to be context dependent because you also have to think that fungi are competing among themselves. And depending on what uh, the other members of the community are, Swillus might outcompete them or not. So it becomes, it's, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I can't give you a straight answer and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, it seems to me that you, you could have pot experiments in which you have um, uh, larch and pine growing together in the same pot and then individually, mm -hmm. and then inoculate them with their natal soils. Um, where they're growing together and where they're not growing together. And then you're giving them the whole community to choose from. And so, I mean, I think the potential importance here is how much do the fungi okay. actually contribute to uh, the forest community? Yes. So, so but, coming at it from the tree's perspective okay, rather yeah. than just the, uh, uh, the fungal perspective might mm -hmm. help sort it out. Yes. So that's a great, great idea. The only detail is that when you when you bring the soil from the field and you put it in a pot and you're trying to expose your seedlings to the whole community, what you end up having is a very small subset of the fungal community that is in nature. So in my my serpentine experiment, that's what I did. I grabbed the soil from the from the forest and I plucked some seedlings on it with the hopes that you know all the fungi are going to get into the roots and then I trans uh, I transplant the the tree to another soil type and I see how they do. Well, the, so maybe the way to deal with that is simply have a pot experiment, but the pots are out in the forest. I mean, when we, mm -hmm. when we go to a greenhouse, we get a greenhouse community eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It uh, can be pretty fast actually. Yeah. But if you have the pots in the field, mm -hmm. uh, then that may get rid of that problem. Yeah, the problem, yeah, that we, we, we can try to do that. The other issue is that, so the other piece of, of, of data and evidence that I can give you for uh, documenting the, the relevance of, of the fungi for the trees is that I didn't mention it, but in my pot experiment with the oaks, I had controls where I sterilized the soil. So I basically just killed all the fungi and I planted replicates of my seedlings to kind of see what is the 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 importance of the fungi for for this uh for these seedlings and is it more important on serpentine soils than non-serpentine soils and what i can tell you is that all the seedlings died equally so at least in that context without the fungi the the, the seedlings can't can't survive mm -hmm. the way the the way i think the way for them to survive without the fungi is to fertilize them if we give them nutrients, I'm sure they're going to be fine. But without the fungi, they can't. In that that soil that is not great, um, they won't they won't make it. And I assume that uh, this would be uh, replicated in many other for many other types of habitats. So that is like clear evidence that the trees need the fungi. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. You had another one. Yes, uh, it's very interesting to see the lack of population genetic structure in uh, in in Europe with uh, with Julius Litteus in comparison with what you observed before in North America. Is it because of the spatial scale of the study system, 
or is it due to i don't know glaciation or recent recolonization or what what is your your opinion yeah. about it? Ugh, that's a very good question so there's several options uh so the answer is i don't know right but <laughs> if i had to speculate i would say uh could be spatial scale right because they're just you know they're the spores are being dispersed they can go far presumably and so you can just have constant mating and and so <laughs> basically what you're going to have is like having blondes and brunettes within the same population so you do have different phenotypes but they, they don't cluster into uh, different genetic groups another option is that this uh, zinc smelters uh, have been in place for only 150 years. So they're recent. So maybe what's happening is that there hasn't been enough time for them to differentiate. Because another problem is we don't know what the generation time is. We have no idea. We assume it's a year, but we don't know. How, how do we know? We have no idea. <laughs> so if it's 10 years, then it's going to take a long time for them to adapt, right? If they, if they, if on the other hand, if they're reproducing every month and we're just not seeing it, then you can expect evolution to be much faster. I don't know. And, the, and this is what I realized when, you know, I got so frustrated with studying communities and I shifted to populations like, oh, crap, <laughs> we have the same types of issues. <laughs> we still can't can't say much. <laughs> but, you know, as I said, we shouldn't give up. Right. It's just like just try to gather small uh, to set up small experiments and gather uh, small piles of data to try to get closer to some kind of answer. So it just takes time and it's just, you know, convincing funding agencies that we need to keep on going. <laughs> it's not very easy. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question for the audience. Can I? <laughs> yes. No, please go ahead. So, and I think you, uh, there was a question for Jess that kind of alluded to this. How do we, how do we take into account the plant genotypes, right? How do we, how do we know? How can we? Is there an easy way? Because <laughs> what I wanted to do was to do genome scans on the pines on this metal tolerant uh, study, right? So, because if we could do uh, one of my theories that I don't know if it's right or, or not is that that the fungus is protecting the plant from metal toxicity, and one of the consequences might be that it the fungus is sheltering the plant, and so. Uh, the plant might not be able, might not have to evolve to, to to respond to metal tolerance to metal toxicity at all, because maybe it just doesn't feel it. And so, in that scenario, we would have something that I called uh, environmental sheltering, where you have a mutualist a mutualism where one partner evolves, in this case the fungus, and the plant doesn't because it doesn't have to. And this means that it would be kind of like the opposite of this arms race, right, where one the host evolves and the pathogen evolves and the pathogen evolves and you have this, this never ending evolution. And in this case, in the mutualistic uh, context, you might have the opposite where one partner evolves and the other one just stays put, there's stasis. I don't know how to test this on the plant part. So how do I do that? <laughs> well, that's a fascinating and good question. Would anybody like to hazard an answer? <clears throat> Ideally, it's easy and cheap <laughs> <laughs> and fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Christian, yes. Well, you chose the pines, so it's not cheap. That's <laughs> the problem. But, uh, well, I would say you just do the same thing. So you look at if you'd find genetic differences in pines in heavy metal polluted and non-polluted uh, environments. And if your theory is correct, you should find non, no, no, no differences. Difference. Or if you do a, a common garden experiment within the sites, you should find no differences. Uh, if you so find it, you have both. And then you most likely have interactions between the genotypes, yeah. which is very interesting then. Yeah, and then one of my practical questions is, how are the reference genomes for pines? Do we have good references and good annotations or because I know they're gigantic, right? They're, they're large genomes, which is a bummer. 
But are they, they are not? Are they, they are not. They are not really good. They are there. There's mm -hmm. also, there's Pinus teda. There's other uh, Lambertiana and all these species that are now sequenced. Okay. But they are not really good. But I think the main problem is also the costs that you have. So if yeah. you don't select only a part of the genome, you will, your costs will explode. Yeah. You could do something like a pool seek approach where you have like uh, you pool uh, tolerant versus non-tolerant trees, which mm -hmm. could be very cheap. Mm -hmm. But still, if you have, you will have hits or, and you will not probably not know where they are or what their yeah. function is. But I mean, it's, it is information is there. It's just not mm -hmm. as good as in other yeah. species. So that would mean that I would have to, I would have to hire someone that knows about tree genomes to, to do this project. So I won't be able to do it. <laughs> All right. One, one thing, maybe to take advantage of existing experimental setups, because we certainly have those in pines. So, mm -hmm. you know, if that, if we can, it, it probably won't cross metal, to, metal, you know, a presence levels, but a, you know, there may be something in the structures we already have that would, would help. Mm -hmm. And certainly, mm -hmm. you know, we've done experiments where Suyalis is certainly present on the, on the pines that we're looking at. So um, if that's of interest, then we can certainly follow up on that. But, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, I would have the fungi and the pines from the same sites, right? Because that's yeah. what, yeah, that would be the, the best case scenario. But uh, yeah, anyway, thank you. <laughs> and uh, ben, then, uh, yeah, you had another. Yeah, just to complement what is uh, to the discussion, um, it's also important to kind of assess the, the transcriptomic response of the trees. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not aware of a, of a pine clone system, but that's what we are, we are doing with Martina and other colleagues mm -hmm, to use mm -hmm. also a clone to kind of assess the role of um, now the response, the transcriptomic response at the tree level, and then uh, increase, if possible, the number of genotypes at the tree level. Mm -hmm. so, so what what we're doing right now is in, in the experiment that just talked about uh, that bioassay with Swillus um, part of the grant that she just got um, is for uh, doing metatranscriptomics on the roots. So basically, we're just going to extract the RNA, the fungal and the pine RNA, and we're going to separate them out and basically try to look for signatures of stress on, on the pine and on the, on the fungus and see if there are differences across different treatments when we have more zinc or less zinc and when we have a tolerant or a non-tolerant uh, as isolate. So that, that is a great point. The issue with transcriptomics is that it's messy, <laughs> right? It's messy, it's hard to get because there's, it's so noisy. Uh, that if the, the signal is very strong, then it's great because you can say something, but for the most part, it's like kind of all over. And so it feels like it's another exploration of what could be out there. <laughs> and many times you don't get the answers that you would like to, or or not, not the answers you'd like, but clear answers you'd like to have. And maybe you have an, another, ex uh, you have a different experience and you have some tips on how to make the noisiness go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, we work with our colleagues from Nancy, and we have a pisolitis uh, strain collection. And uh, we see that uh, depending on which strains we use, uh, that's all the work done in, in Nancy, but which strain is used, we use different transcriptomic responses in the popular clone. So, mm -hmm. And this is very strong, and the variation between replicates is quite low. So, um, of course, we don't have the, the broad picture. But we see that at the, at the transcriptomic level, uh, yeah, there is already a lot of a lot of things going on. Uh, so then, they, when we increase the number of genotypes at the tree level, we have to make sure that they are really in contrasting environments to make sure that the crosses then make sense. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. that makes sense. Great.